Good day, Deep and Word family. Welcome to day 247 of our Bible study review. Today, we're going through chapters 22 through 25 of the book of Job. So here we go again with more accusations from Job's so-called friends after he has already lost everything. And if you find yourself getting weary of all the back and forth with Job's case, imagine how Job feels. But better yet, imagine how Yeshua feels. He is our advocate. He is the attorney at law. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he is the one interceding on behalf of all of the saints, the ones who follow Messiah, and not just us, but even those who don't follow him. The enemy is going before the Father, accusing them of their lawlessness, and then he is given permission to continue to do what he does, which is steal, kill, and destroy with those who agree with his lawlessness. So imagine how the Messiah feels. Imagine how he feels right now. Day in, day out, he is fighting court cases. He is dismissing and acquitting, or he is saying, well, you kind of got me on that one because this one's not even under my covenant. They're actually in covenant with you. I just wanted to give you some heavenly perspective because our Messiah, once he gave up his spirit and then he rose back to life, yeah, he's not done with his work. He is working continually, interceding. Y'all better appreciate your advocate, your attorney at law, your Messiah, the one who's interceding on your behalf, because he's working nonstop. All right, now let's open up chapter 22 and we see that Eliphaz steps up yet again to passive aggressively question Job. And so these are the two questions that he has. The first one, he says, can a man be profitable to Elohim as he who is wise may be profitable to himself? Is it any pleasure to the Almighty that you are righteous or is it a gain to him that you make your ways blameless? So do you see him trying to retract and backtrack because he's losing his footing with Job? He's saying, well, if you are righteous, how does it profit Elohim anyways? And here's question number two from Eliphaz to Job in verse five. He says, is not your wickedness great and your iniquity infinite? At this point, Eliphaz looks really unstable. He's not sure in his footing, so he's going to continue with false accusations. Let's pick up in verse seven. This is false accusation number one. He says, you have not given water to the weary to drink and you have withheld bread from the hungry. That's a lie. That's not the truth about Job. And so here's another lie. He's going to speak on his so-called friend. He says, you have sent widows away empty and the strength of the fatherless was crushed. Therefore, snares are all around you and sudden fears of trouble or around you, or darkness so that you cannot see, and an abundance of waters covers you. Again, false, false, false. Job had maid servants and he had servants. Most likely he took a widow or he took orphans in to shelter and care for them because that's the character of Job. Now those who were under his care departed from him once all of his riches were taken away. Eliphaz continues. He says, that's why you are receiving punishment because you have done these things. And this is so not the case with Job. And so now Eliphaz wants to counsel him to correct his ways so that he can stand right before the judge. Let's pick up in verse 21. He says to Job, now acquaint yourself with him and be at peace. Thereby good will come to you. Receive, I pray, the teaching from his mouth. He is claiming to be speaking on behalf of of the judge. Do you see the pride and the arrogance of Eliphaz? Oh my gosh. Now he says, and lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be built up and you will put away iniquity far from your tents. Let's pick up in verse 27 and 28 with more pride and arrogance from Eliphaz. He says, you will make your prayer to him and he will hear you and you will pay your vows. You will also declare a matter and it will be established unto you and the light will shine upon your ways. Um, is he saying that Job doesn't have light right now? That he does not see clearly because he's not walking righteously? The patience of Job is beyond my understanding. And let's drive it home with verse 30. He says, he will even deliver one who is not 
innocent. Do you see how he's saying this about Job? He says, he will be delivered by the purity of your hands. And now this does allude to the fact that there will come an advocate who will dismiss the cases of those who are even guilty. And that's all of us. But at that moment in time, Eliphaz is saying that at some point he will wipe away even those transgressions of those who are guilty. And this is definitely him calling Job a guilty man. And now the defendant Job rises up in chapter 23. Let's read what he has to say, starting from verse two. He says, today also my complaint is bitter. My hand is heavy because of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. So Job is saying, I wish that I could find him. I wish that I had an advocate. I wish that I could see the face of Yahuwah. Then I would present my case before him. And although Job does not have an advocate and he does not have an answer from on high yet, this is Job speaking in faith. Let's pick up in verse 10. He says, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. My foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his ways and I have not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So the book of Job does not account for any written law being down anywhere. Yet Job says he has not departed from the commandments of his lips. And he says he considers the words of Yahuwah more than physical food. If we don't get to that point, we will not be able to stand to the very end. Let me share the truth with you. I eat one physical meal a day, but I eat several spiritual meals throughout the day because I can attest to the same words as Job. If we aren't doing everything in our power to raise up our spirit man and to edify and feed the spirit man, then the flesh is going to take over. You're either feeding one or starving the other. There is no in between. Our Messiah died and gave us the deposit of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is here to correct and guide us. But if we don't insert the word, there can be no correction. There can be no renewing of the mind. The spiritual food is so much more edifying. It feeds more than physical food ever could. If this statement wasn't the truth with Job, he would have taken his life long ago. Yet he still has strength to stand even against his so-called friends who are accusing him falsely. If he did not feed upon every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yah, he would not be making it at this point. So what's the most important meal of the day? This one is. Now we open up chapter 24 and Job continues. He has a very important question to ask. Let's open up from verse one. He says, times are not hidden from El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. And why have not those who know him seen his days? So what Job is trying to say essentially is that since Elohim or God is judge and he knows all things, then why does he keep from the godly his ways? Why is he remaining secretive? Why doesn't he show himself to the righteous? Then Job goes on to talk about the ways of the wicked. And so let's pick up in verse two. He says, they remove landmarks. They rob and feed on flocks. They drive away the donkey of the fatherless. They take the widow's ox as a pledge. They turn the needy out of the way. The poor of the earth are hidden together. So they make the poor hide and then they take the last of what a widow has for a pledge. More actions of the wicked. Let's pick up in verse nine. He says, they snatch away the fatherless from the breast and take pledge from the poor. So a widow who doesn't have a father, she has a little child and then they take the child from her breast. They take everything. This is what the wicked do. He says, he leaves them naked. They shall go out without a garment and hungry. They shall take away 
sheaves. So they take everything, even the clothing off of their back, and they make the needy and the poor run around without clothes. Verse 13, he says, they have become rebels against the light. They have not known his ways nor remained in his paths. Let's pick up in verse 22, because Job has something to say about the character of the Almighty, he says, but he draws the mighty away with his power. He raises up and no one is certain of his life. So no one's life is safe when they're in the hands of the Almighty. And he says in verse 23, he gives him safety and he leans on it, yet his eyes are on their ways. They are lifted up for a little while, then they are gone and they shall be brought low. Like all, they are gathered up and they are cut off like the heads of grain. And if it is not so, who proves me a liar and makes my word worthless? Job is challenging them. He says, look, you have called yourself wise men that you know the ways of the wicked. You're calling me wicked, yet I stand innocent. And here are the wicked prospering. But we know that all of the lives of all image bearers are in the hands of the Almighty. So although the wicked may prosper for a while, their life and their deeds are in his hands and he will render judgment. And he says, test me. Who's going to prove me wrong on this word? And now chapter 25, this is Bildad answering Job. And he says, rule and reverence belong to him, making peace in his high places. And he says, is there any number to his armies? And on whom does his light not rise. So he causes the light to shine on the wicked and the righteous. And so he says in verse four, so how could man be righteous before L? So they all seem to be losing track because they say that Job is a wicked man. And Job is saying, I'm not a wicked man. And they're asking, well, how could you be righteous before him? And his friends are losing footing to their accusations. But it's a very important question. How could man be righteous before the almighty judge? And there's only one way, although they didn't know it back then. They're alluding to a very important question. There's only one way that we could be made righteous, and that's the righteousness of Christ. That's the righteousness of the attorney at law, the one who came and filled up the requirements of the law and paid it with his life so that he could deposit the spirit and give you his life so that you may live and so that you may stand before the judge in his righteousness so that when the father looks at you, all he sees is the blood of his son and he says, not guilty. But in Job's case, before we ever started reading this book, Yahuwah the Father said that Job was a blameless and perfect man. But his friends cannot accept the truth that was already declared before this case ever begun. Job is blameless before Yahuwah. But poor Job does not have an advocate and he does not have a witness to stand next to him and agree. The patience of Job is truly a virtue. When you read this book, hopefully you will appreciate the work of your high priest, the work of your advocate, because he loves you so much. Job would do anything to be in our place. Deep and Word family, that's all that I have for you today. Until tomorrow, Yah bless.